My books, The Origin of Names, Words, and Everything in Between, Volumes 1 and 2, are available to purchase from most major booksellers in all major formats. Order your copies today so you can enjoy these books for yourself and help support the channel. Every living thing on our planet, whether it be an animal, plant, or some kind of fungi, has a name. Well, a name we've given out, say. We have no idea what daisies or ants are actually calling one another, I suppose. But if we discover a new animal or plant, we probably give it a name. While most living beings have a name they're commonly known by, they also have a more fancy, somewhat longer, scientific name too, formed of two words. For example, us humans are more correctly called Homo sapiens, or how the western honeybee is more correctly called Apis mellifera. The common garden tulip is really called the Tulipa gesneriana, and the largest living animal to have ever lived, the blue whale, really goes by the name of Balanoptera musculus. Literally every single form of life on our planet, no matter how big or small, plant or beast, extinct or living amongst us, has a name that follows this pattern. On top of this, every form of life also fits into a hierarchical classification system, which helps us understand how animals and plants relate to one another, from what species they're in to what kingdom they reside under. These naming systems, or taxonomy systems I ought to say, to give them their proper name, are known by pretty much everyone to some degree or another. Like, we've all at least heard of the Animal Kingdom, right? And no, I'm not talking about the Disney theme park. Though Expedition Everest is one of my favourite roller coasters. I, I should talk about theme parks one day. But anyway, this isn't defunct land. These ways in which we name things and the system we place them in didn't just come out of thin air. These systems of giving living beings two names and putting everything into a classification system were devised and popularized by just one man. It was this man who came up with the way in which we name pretty much everything. Well, at least everything that lives anyway. And his very own name was Carolus Linnaeus, which in his native Swedish was Carl von Linnaeus but most people these days just call him Karl. As mentioned, Karl was Swedish, born in 1707 in Småland. No, not the IKEA play area, but the part of Sweden. He actually came from a somewhat poorer background. His father was a keen gardener, and from an early age, he was entrenched in the world of plants by his father, who would teach him all about them. By the age of five, he even had a little garden to himself. At this time in history, most plants had strange, ancient, long names, which were difficult to remember. Yet, Carl took a keen interest in memorizing as many as he could. His love of plants eventually expanded into all living creatures as he succeeded in school and eventually went to university, initially studying medicine at the University of Lund before transferring to Uppsala University to study plants, animals and minerals in medicine. But as mentioned, he was from a poorer background, which made university difficult for him. This intelligence however caught the attention of his lecturers and other academics, including Swedish botanist Olaf Celsius, whose brother Anders Celsius would go on to be the namesake of the superior temperature measuring system. Between receiving funding from his peers and actually teaching some botany lessons himself, Carl was able to fund and produce his two most famous works, Systema Natura, first published in 1735, and its follow-up of Species Plantarum, first published in 1753. Carl really felt that there ought to be an easy and precise way to name things, and for them to all sit in an organized system. This mostly stemmed, pun intended, from his youth being confused by plant names in his little garden. These two writings set out his ideas on how things should be named. Starting with Systema Natula in 1735. This wasn't some huge tome, but instead a simple 11 page pamphlet initially. However, further editions would expand. Though in that initial edition of the pamphlet, he laid out his two most well known of concepts. That being his idea for all living beings to have two names, known correctly as binomial names, as well as his hierarchy classification system, also known as taxonomic ranking. While this was all laid out in his first work, his second work, Species Plantulum, is really where he ran with the concept, naming every known plant in it with his binomial name rule. This proved to be so popular that in later editions of his earlier writing of Systema Natura, he started to apply binomial names to animals too. But what exactly are these systems of binomial names and taxonomic 
economic rankings I am actually talking about. Well, let's look into them in more detail, shall we? Starting with binomial names. From the get-go, you can probably understand why they are called binomial. This literally means two names. His idea was that all living creatures would have two names, with these two names reflecting what genus they are from, as well as the second name for them more specifically, aka for their species. The whole genus and species thing will come into more play with his taxonomical ranking idea, which we'll talk about in a moment. We mentioned our own binomial name earlier, Homo sapiens, and that's a great one to highlight even more. The first of these kinds of names, Homo in our case, is called the generic name. This relates as mentioned to the overarching genus of these creatures. This means that Homo sapiens are part of the Homo genus, Homo of course meaning man. The latter name, sapiens for us, is called the specific name. This highlights what specific member or species of the genus is being talked about. Sapiens comes from Latin roots and means to be wise, so our name means something along the lines of smart man or wise man. For the record, all these binomial names are in Latin, because Latin is the go-to language for all things fancy and sciencey. Of course, there were other species of homos too, so these other species will have the same generic name as us, homo, but their specific names are different to highlight that they are different to us in one way or another. This includes Homo erectus, named after the fact they could stand erect, or Homo neanderthalensis, named after the Neanderthal Valley in Germany where their remains were first found. This naming system easily shows us that these kinds of creatures are related to one another through their generic names names, but have differences thanks to their specific names. It's a really smart concept and makes understanding how different types of life interact and relate to one another much easier to grasp. In fact, it was such a smart idea that he didn't really invent it. Carl was heavily inspired by the work of 16th century brothers of Gaspar and Joan Bohr. It was these two who came up with this initial idea. Carl was just the one who perfected it, brought it back a few hundred years later and and ran with it. Something that was a tad more his own creation was his taxonomic ranking. This was the idea of putting different kinds of life into specific groups, which get more specific the lower down the ranks. At the top of these rankings you will find the kingdom, and the lowest eventual rank is their unique species. For example, the crested gecko has the species binominal name of Corolophus salatus, and it is part of the Animalia kingdom, whereas the common sunflower, Helianthus annuus, belongs to the Plantar Kingdom. There's quite a lot between kingdom and species however, especially with animals. Today, animal taxonomy ranks go kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then species. There are all different kinds of classes, or phylum, or order that animals can be in. Let's run with the example of the brown bear, which has the binomial name of Ursus actos. This species is part of the Ursus genus, which includes other bears. They're then part of the Ursine family, which includes all bears. This family is then part of the carnivora order, which includes other meat-eating mammals, including the likes of cheetahs and walruses. All these carnivora are part of the mammalia class, which includes all milk-producing creatures such as whales, cows, and even us. They are then part of the chordate phylum, which are primarily animals with backbones. This means that our initial brown bear is now linked with the likes of sharks and parrots. And finally, this phylum links into the whole animal kingdom kingdom. When read like this it's a little confusing, and hopefully I've animated this part of the video in a way so it makes things a little clearer. But what this ranking system does is link all creatures into one kingdom, which then diversifies lower down the ranks. There's of course separate plant and fungi kingdoms too. When Carl first created this concept, he included a mineral kingdom as well, which hasn't stood the test of time as much as the rest of his concepts. But between popularizing binomial names and his creation of taxonomy rankings, Carl devised a way in which we can easily name any living thing and understand how they relate to all other things. Because of this work, he has been dubbed the father of taxonomy. But we could even stretch out that title and simply dub him the father of names. Because not only did he create these naming systems, he actually named a huge amount of plants and animals himself. 
one source touted that he named 4,400 kinds of animals and 7,700 kinds of plants. One of my favorite names he coined was of the lemurs. This comes from the Latin lemurs, which were a kind of ghost. Carl applied this name to these creatures as he felt they looked very ghost-like with their slender figures and large eyes. A lot of the names used in binomial naming relates to characteristics of the creatures. However, in more recent times, people have had a lot more fun with these names, looking towards popular culture when it comes to naming new discoveries. For example, when an extinct new species of bandicoot was discovered, it was given the binomial name of Crash Bandicoot, with Crash being the genus name now. This was of course in honour of the video game character of the same name. There's also a huge selection of animals that have been named after Pokemon too. Yeah, all the nerdy kids that play Pokemon are grown up and become nerdy adults in respectable fields. This includes a type of bee called the Chilicola Charizard, an extinct reptile named the Bulbasaurus Fulioxiron. These nerdy names might not have existed if it weren't for Carl's work. While he is celebrated now, his work has also come under scrutiny in recent times. Carl was a leading figure in something known as scientific racism. This was the belief that certain groups of humans were inferior to others based on things such as their biology. It's not great stuff and has to be highlighted when talking about this man. There have been debates in recent times as to whether we should stop celebrating his work or if we shouldn't judge people in the past by our modern standards. But whatever the future holds for Linnaeus and his legacy, his work and how it's shaped our understanding and usage of names cannot be denied. This video topic was suggested by Tej Boss over on my Patreon. Every Wednesday, I put up a video request post over on my Patreon for my awesome patrons to leave video ideas on. I then pick one of those ideas to be turned into a video the following Wednesday. So if you have a great idea for a Name Explain video and wish to enjoy Name Explain videos ad-free as well as get exclusive content and your name at the end of these videos, then why not support the channel on Patreon? It takes just $1 a month to help the channel in a huge way and gets you all of these amazing benefits. Visit patreon.com forward slash name explain or click the link down below. Name Explain depends on viewers like yourself supporting the channel financially on Patreon, so a huge thank you to everyone who does. Donating just $1 a month helps the channel amazingly and gets you bonuses including ad-free videos, exclusive content, the power to request ideas to be made into actual Name Explain videos, and your name at the end of the video with all these awesome people. Visit patreon.com forward slash name explain or click the link down below to find out how you too can support the channel. Thank you. Thanks for reaching the end of the video. Why not watch another and subscribe to keep up to date on all things Name Explain? You can find myself on Instagram where I'm Name Explain YT and join the Facebook group Friends of Name Explain to talk with myself and other name nerds. All that will be linked down below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and once again, thank you all so much.